Now then guys, how's it going? I hope you're all keeping really, really well. I have obviously got in front of me a box that is about half the size of my entire warm room, as it happens. In fact, I am wondering exactly how I'm going to get this thing out safely. Um, but I'm sure we'll figure it out together. And uh, before we get into it, I just want to give you a really quick introduction to this whole thing. This is a 10-inch Trust Tube Richie Cretian Telescope from Stella Lyra very very kindly indeed provided to me for review and evaluation purposes by first light optics so massive thanks and i mean massive thanks to those guys i am seriously excited to look at this thing but it goes without saying but i'm going to say it anyway i wouldn't be getting any of this stuff sent for review if it wasn't for all the support from you out there so a very special thanks to all of you too it's you that's put me in this position where i can review things and share it all with you now, in terms of disclosures, this is very simple. Uh, First Light Optics have a complete hands-off review policy. So I do what I want, say what I want, evaluate the product exactly how I wish and exactly how I always do on my channel. I simply don't accept reviews for products unless it's like that. So, you know, kudos, top marks to First Light Optics on that one. At least I've got the freedom to deliver you the kind of review that I want to do. Um, so. Without any further ado, let's get stuck in because I can't wait another single minute. This thing looks incredible. So it's well packed, as you can hopefully see. Um, you're not really going to be using this, but it's there. A <laughs> 8AA battery adapter for the cooling fans in this thing. First Light Optics did kindly also provide a Astro Zap shroud uh, in there. This wasn't a lie, by the way may contain clouds, I don't know if you can see that. It's actually raining right now. So uh, classic new scope weather that we're dealing with here. <laughs> now inside of this, uh, there's two insets where we have a two inch spacer. This thing's absolutely enormous. And this is for spacing the uh, focuser away from the actual back plate of the telescope. You've got one of those. And then on the opposite side, you have got two one inch spaces and you can use any combination of these based on what exactly you're using with this telescope if you're operating it at native focal length um, unreduced running our room in this observatory or indeed if you're going to use it with a reducer or a barlow and things like that so you've got a lot of options right there for you now let's see how this thing is going to come apart all right i'm glad to see that's not one single foam block that would have been a nightmare to get out Oh, that looks so trick. Wow. Um, let's figure out exactly how to get this thing out and where its balance point even is too. So, ooh, I wouldn't recommend doing that with one hand, but um, fortunately for me, I've got massive hands. Right, I'm just gonna lean that there one sec. I'll get this box out of the way. All right, guys, so we're debagged and wow. <laughs> It's pretty much all I can say. This thing looks absolutely incredible. I uh, am blown away by the actual quality of construction on this. All these uh, carbon trusses, the thickness of the mounting plates that everything is attached to, the rigidity of the whole build, unbelievable. The secondary mirror support is something particularly impressive too. I mean, that thing, I wouldn't recommend it, but I absolutely feel like you could pick up the entire scope and support it from that thing. It's so rigid. Uh, if you take a look, obviously you've got two Losmandy type dovetails. There you go, matching one on the bottom. And it should be safe for me to turn the scope up on its end. Like so, I'll just keep a hold of this. And uh, talk to you about the features on the actual back of the telescope. Now, as you can see, we have three fans, small cooling fans, up to you whether you want to use those or not. You could power it with a little included battery pack if you so wished, but I'd recommend just getting a 5.5 uh, by 2.1 DC power jack for this thing if you want to use those. We've got quite a large focuser, I do believe it's a 3.25 inch unit. And there's some slippage when you put a few pounds of pressure on. This is a sure enough attention adjustment so when i've just undone that central screw there to the point where it's loose 
there is nothing stopping the focus of slipping it does have an end stop though so should it ever come loose your gear isn't going to end up on the floor which is good news of course <laughs> now yeah so you can control this with this thing and it looks like we have some blanking screws there potentially where it's either for tension adjustment or they are just blanking plates uh, blanking grubs rather for me to attach an EAF eventually which obviously I'd like to do as this is an astrograph it is going to be used with a camera attached do you know what I mean now um, one of the really important distinguishing features of these newer Richard Gretians, the truss tubes is the fact that the focuser itself is decoupled from the primary mirror adjustments on this back plate so the focuser is attached to the back plate the primary mirror itself is separately attached so you can adjust one without adjusting the other which is huge in terms of actually getting a richard cretian collimated um, where without one of these decoupled focuses it's a very iterative process and you have to chase your tail eventually landing on a good collimation by going kind of back and forth between primary adjustments secondary adjustments primary adjustments secondary adjustments you get the idea uh, i've had a few and it is doable but it's not ideal Whereas this is going to simplify things hugely. You can basically, let's say with a laser, put a nice accurate laser into your focuser, adjust using your focuser collimation bolts till your laser point hits the center spot on the secondary mirror, then adjust the secondary mirror until that laser's return beam is going back up itself. So it's perfectly returning along its own path. So then your focuser and your secondary are collimated to one another, they're completely co-aligned. And then all that's left to do is primary adjustment, which you can see through these three large bolts. It's good to see they've used nice large bolts for that as well, and not something small that's going to end up, uh, you know, just jimped up and rounded off very easily. So uh, top marks in terms of construction. The only weak part, as I say, I think is the focuser, but it's still more than strong enough overall. Um, there is a focuser locking knob on the top of this thing, but I probably won't be using that. I never really too much like to use those. We'll see anyway. I think that's probably something that will get upgraded down the line. But the thing I'm really looking forward to right now, I think, is getting this on the mount and actually trying to get a first light shooting. Um, kind of small target, you know what I mean? That's what I'm really aiming for with this shooting planetary nebulae showcase regions of larger targets on their own. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think that could be a heck of a lot of fun to be had with this telescope doing just that kind of thing. So let's pull this back down. It's a chunk. I'd say it's a little bit lighter than my Raster 11, but not by much. It's very close. Um, and that's about it for now. So uh, I've got a big job ahead of me getting this thing mounted up and all ready to go for an imaging session. So I'll come back to you when that's all finished. Now, one of the first things that I kind of really noticed with this thing, once I'd started stacking all the gear on it, you know, and adding to that already quite hefty weight total, is that once I was finished, um, there's really no way I'd want to use this telescope in anything other, really, than an observatory situation. It absolutely is an observatory class telescope, I would say. And um, I'm not saying that, you know, you should completely avoid it if you have a mobile setup, as it would certainly still be doable. But you may need help with certain things, such as remounting the telescope, getting it off at the end of the night if you're in a pack up, pack down kind of scenario. I know that I needed some help getting this thing on the mount because I had to lift it on in a flat pack position while my roof was over. And it's not easy because my pier is so tall. Uh, in fact, the head of my mount is at six foot five, which is incidentally the exact same height as the top of my head. So uh, it's not an easy lift and it's a very awkward telescope in terms of actually getting a hold of it anyway, because everything's poles. Um, it's not like kind of hoisting a tube, which can be easier in some ways, I think. So um, definitely think about that. Mounting this thing and demounting it, uh, there is the risk of damage, not just to the telescope, but to yourself. So definitely do your due diligence and uh, have a good look at what your mount is capable of holding and also perhaps what you're reliably capable of holding without injury. Now the next thing that I really want to kind of pay some attention to on this telescope because it's extremely important is the collimation procedure. Um, it is of course a user collimatable telescope so it is something you are absolutely going to have to do. So if it's, you know, if you don't have any taste for collimation, you don't want to do it, I fully understand. <laughs> 
but just, you know, know that this isn't the telescope for you. Um, however, if you're up for it, it is actually not anywhere near as bad as I was expecting. Um, I have collimated a few of the smaller Richard Gretians in my time, the six inch models in particular. And they're kind of difficult to get right, you know what I mean? It's a case of chasing your tail a little bit until you land on a perfect co-alignment with those smaller riches. Uh, and that is because they don't have a decoupled focuser from the primary mirror adjustments. So on the smaller Richard Gretians, when you make an adjustment to those primary mirror bolts, you're also adjusting the focuser's tilt in relation to the secondary mirror. It's a nightmare. I don't know why, why they've opted to do that, but on the bigger ones at least, it's completely fixed and it is an awesome collimation system, to be honest. You get the expected results. Um, I can't say really enough good things about it. So what I'm instead going to do is I'm going to talk to you about how I do it myself. It's really broken down into a three-part process, thanks to it being a decoupled focuser. Like I keep mentioning, and I do keep mentioning it because it is so important and it's intrinsic to actually this thing's success as a such being such a usable scope, I think. So part one is going to be make sure you've got a good laser <laughs> or something like that, uh, because you're going to want to pop this into your focuser. Make sure you introduce no clamping errors when tightening it down, you know, so it's indexed perfectly and well and tightly. So it's not going to move around as you make your next adjustments. And then you're going to use the focuser axis adjustment push pull bolts there's three and align this perfectly with the optical axis of your secondary mirror by pointing the laser beam into the middle of the secondary mirror donut really easy literally takes a couple of minutes lock that down you shouldn't have to touch it for a good while i would imagine because this telescope's actual mechanics are really really good it's one of its strongest points for me uh, you've got confidence after making a collimation adjustment what you then need to do is leave your laser in place don't touch anything else go around to the front of the telescope and then looking at the return beam which if it's anywhere near close it should be landing somewhere on the faceplate of your focuser you need to start then adjusting the secondary mirror bolts until you return your laser's output back down into its own aperture so it's perfectly co-aligned at that point your focuser is aligned to your secondary mirror axis your secondary mirror is then bouncing straight back down into your laser everything is co-aligned the last adjustment to make then phase three is going to probably in most cases be done on a star and that's your primary mirror adjustments really the most important one i would argue now if you happen to have something like a howie glatter laser with a holographic attachment uh you can actually do your primary too while, you know, not having to see a clear night sky. But if, you know, anything like me and you don't have that kind of thing, then you have to do it old school using a star. Now, I started off by doing it with a defocused star with my camera in place, everything as I was actually going to use it for imaging. So I wasn't going to have to touch anything once I was done. And I used a defocused star and that image really helps you get things co like co-aligned properly. So you may know, um, getting your secondary mirrors shadow central is a good indicator and then the next best indicator i found is once you start to really approach focus so you're not looking at a massively defocused star pattern anymore but you're looking at a nearly focused star what you really want to be seeing at the last possible moment is a, a spot of light in the middle of a ring of light uh, and i mean centralized that would indicate a good state of collimation and it is absolutely doable just on a star it, of course it is people have been doing it for years but there was a piece of software that i happened to find while kind of researching how to do this and that is metaguide and it actually saved my bacon on this because it made the whole thing the whole process of having to do this in an observatory situation where i was out in the observatory with a set of allen keys and a head torch <laughs> kind of viewing my screen through through the door uh, a lot easier I have to say and I will be using it again and again it really is good so the next time this thing needs collimation which is actually going to be very soon because I'm changing a part on this telescope more on that next I will be using MetaGuide for that primary adjustment now I'm going to run a small segment here on the night when I actually discovered and first used MetaGuide uh, and I, that should kind of demonstrate to you how the user interface looks and uh, my thoughts on it on that night.
Well guys, I think I've almost got it finished now in terms of collimation. This primary mirror I think is done. Um, I've been messing around trying to do it with SharpCap, a, like a live view video feed. Moving the star back to center for collimation accuracy after each and every adjustment. And it was working, but it was too much of a laborious mess around process, to be honest with you. So after a little bit of Googling, I kept seeing one particular piece of software keep getting recommended by people. And I can see why it's called MetaGuide. And uh, man, I've downloaded this thing. I downloaded the direct show drivers for my camera. And now once it's all set up, it's able to actually keep a star centered in your field of view while you're out there just looking at the screen from, let's say, in the observatory, making those collimation adjustments. It even has a live feedback view like we're looking at right here. So this red dot indicating any chromatic aberrations. And uh, it started off and I was a little bit with it constantly over to the left right there. However, after some a uh, little bit of a period of time adjusting. You can see now it is most of the time centered or at least dancing around the center either side, which is absolutely fine. All viewing now is seeing based aberrations, I would say. So it looks to me like the scope is in pretty much perfect collimation at this point, And it is thanks to this software that I've been able to get it done quickly. Uh, so huge, huge shout out for anybody looking at getting your scope collimated. Um, Meta guide seems to be a really good way to do it as long as you've got stars visible really impressed and uh, i'm glad to say i think it's done and i can actually start to do some imaging when it's an hour a proper clear night well the last thing i really want to touch upon on this and it is an important point is the build quality of the whole telescope now the telescope itself is absolutely phenomenally well built it's so rigid and stiff collimation works exactly as you would expect you're not kind of introducing tilt errors and things with <laughs> one adjustment that you then have to alter out with the next adjustment down the line like you have to do on let's say a cheap Newtonian or something like that I've done it a million times and I'm just kind of used to it so changing to a system of this quality was a bit of a shock to be honest where collimation just works as expected a really good shock a really bad shock however <laughs> was this <laughs> the focuser um I don't mean to make fun of it or anything like that, but it's just, it's not in keeping with the rest of the telescope. It looks nice. It's a nice enough looking unit and it feels all right. But in terms of actual usability, it's uh, it's not good. Uh, I have to say, it's, it's, so it's a Crayford type focuser. As you can see, there's a, a linear bearing plate right there. You adjust the tension through the pinion, which bears down on that bearing plate with this one screw right here whose threads, by the way, are too coarse. So just a, an eighth of a turn of adjustment goes from being completely undone to being completely too tight. So, you know, you really need to <laughs> be aware of that if you are going to try and make a go of it with this focuser. Finding the sweet spot is it's not easy. The next issue is that even with a relatively light payload, like this one, you can see this is just an 8 by 1.25 inch filter wheel with a carbon camera on not even a particularly large camera small amounts of pressure laterally applied like you will find with your telescope at certain points in angles let's say when uh, this lobe of the filter wheel and the weight that that possesses is at its most mechanically advantageous point against your focuser is enough to apply deflection noticeable enough to actually alter your collimation so <laughs> It's not good. It's just, like I say, if you are going to think about purchasing this telescope, and it really sucks, of course, but I need to make you aware of it, um, you are going to have to buy another focuser. So to that end, I reached out to First Light Optics. I told them what I thought about the focuser, and uh, <laughs> they agreed, funnily enough, to say, you know, it's 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 not a good focuser. Uh, we have looked at stocking them without the focusers. But it makes such a small difference on price that they decided to just keep it on there anyway in the knowledge that most people are going to change them. Now, what they did is they recommended a few different focuses to me and I'm actually literally just about to swap this out with this unit right here that they very kindly sent through long for extended uh, usage with this telescope. And this is a TS 2.5 inch unit with a much longer focus of draw tube as you can see by the fact it protrudes through here. This thing only moves... 50 mil does the uh, 
the actual original unit, whereas this has got a lot longer travel, so I can use it with a wider variety of accessories. Let's say if I want to try some planetary with a Barlow or something like that, I'll be able to rack it right back out without needing to use a ton of extension tubes. But the difference in build quality between these two is utterly night and day, and, and I can't stress that enough. This focuser, even with, let's say, the it extended all the way out here, there's no detectable lateral movement with quite a lot of pressure on way more than a two inch filter wheel or something like that is going to put on there but i have no fear whatsoever in recommending this particular unit to you it doesn't have a silly rattling locking plate like you can see right here this thing's useless really for getting re-indexed reliably this screws on it's all in one piece right you can see this is literally attached to the rotator on this focuser it's all one threaded piece so you just thread this on and then in any rotation adjustments you want to make you're going to use the actual rotator for which by the way locks down nicely and again doesn't introduce deflection i have carefully looked at this thing this is a toothed focuser you know what i mean it's a true rack and pinion as you can see so uh, again you are going to be able to work with this thing without that issue of slippage that you encounter with Crayfords. Um, it's, it's just all together. I mean, I don't see why you'd buy such a telescope as that one out there that I'm in the process of reviewing and then stick with that other focuser. Um, it just doesn't make sense. So if you do get one, do yourself a favor get a proper focuser alongside with it now i'm going to review this thing alongside the telescope once i've had some more usage with it but i'm really confident in this unit i think it's going to be absolutely perfect and for the cost of this i feel like i can already recommend it to you you know um so i'm going to leave this right there the next video i'm going to have this installed along with the eaf and all that good stuff and we're hopefully going to go after a target I did manage a very, very, very brief first light on this thing on the Orion Nebula. Uh, my guiding wasn't sorted or anything like that, so it's not great. It's only 20 minutes long, but I'll show you it anyway, just for a teaser of the kind of field of view that we're dealing with. And with that, I am going to leave you there and just say thank you so much for your time if you've made it this far. Um, I really do appreciate you guys, all of you, all the support that you give. And show towards me is phenomenal and uh, hand on heart. I never expected I'd be in this position and I'm only here because of you. So thank you. I'm going to leave you there anyway. Won't take up any more of your time. Hope you have a wonderful day doing whatever it is that you want to do and hopefully an abundance of clear skies.